Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to this brand new episode of the podcast called The Dictionary. If you are listening to this before um, May 10th, 2020, it is the newest episode. It is brand new. But if you are listening to any time past tomorrow, uh, then it is old. I don't know why I said that. I just thought of it at that moment. Because every single time I say it's brand new. Because it is for a day. Um, All right. Oh, I wanted to say um, there is a couple of adult things coming up in about the middle of this episode. So if you are an adult listening with children, um, maybe you should just listen to it first and skip that one part if you don't want them to hear this. Um, Otherwise, you know, if you want them to be a well-rounded, well-educated person of the world, then let them listen to the whole thing. The first word is best. It is the third form of... Um, noun from before the 12th century. Number one, the best state or part. Number two, one that is best, as in the best falls short. Well, how can the best fall short? It's the best. Number three, the greatest degree of good or excellence. For A, one's maximum effort, as in do your best. I'm trying. For B, a best performance or achievement as in ran a new personal best number five best clothes as in sunday best now we have a phrase at best uh in the last episode in the last word we had a phrase as best this one is at best and it means under the most favorable circumstances now we have the fourth form of best which is looking very weird to me now Um, It is a transitive verb from 1863, to get the better of. Synonym is outdo. And now we have the fifth and final form of best. It is a verbal auxiliary from 1914, and it means had best, as in, you best listen. Yeah, you best listen, because I'm about to tell you some words that mean stuff. And I'm going to say their meanings. Now we have best ball. It is two words with a hyphen. Adjective from 1909. One, relating to or being a golf match in which one player competes against the best individual score of two or more players for each hole. Number four. The, no, number, number two. Ah, see, you'll see why I made that mistake. Number two. The synonym is four ball. I saw four and I said four. Uh, Now we have the word best boy. It is a noun from 1937. This is one of those that you see in movie credits and nobody who's not in the movie business, uh, nobody knows what it is, but it's one of those that just sticks out as saying, I want to be the best boy or make some joke about it. Um, But I will tell you the meaning. The chief assistant to the gaffer in motion picture or television production. Well, now you're going to say, what's the gaffer? You're just going to have to wait. Now we have best case. It is two words with a hyphen. Adjective from 1973. Being relating to or based on a projection of future events that assumes only the best possible circumstances, as in a best case scenario. I think we are currently living in not the best case scenario. This is a very bad timeline. Or maybe it's going to be great. I don't know. Um, Now we have the word bestead. It is the first form, adjective, from the 14th century. It is archaic, and the synonym is situated. Next is the second form of bestead. It is a transitive verb from 1578. One is archaic. Synonym is help. Help, help. I feel like I said that recently. Number two is also archaic. To be useful to. Synonym is avail. Next is the part where we start to get into some um, adult things. Maybe not so much this word, but definitely the next one. Okay, this one is bestial. B-E-S-T-I-A-L. It is an adjective from the 14th century. 1A, of or relating to beasts. 1B, resembling a beast. 2A, lacking intelligence or reason. To be marked by base or inhuman instincts or desires. Synonym is brutal. And then it repeats, synonym is brutal. I think that's for all of the definitions, but the last, the other brutal was just for to be. Bestialize is a transitive verb and bestially is an adverb. 
Next, we have bestiality. It is a noun from the 14th century. The condition, uh, I should say number one, the condition or status of a lower animal. Number two, display or gratification of bestial traits or impulses. And number three, sexual relations between a human being and a lower animal. I don't think they're lower than us. I think that they are equal um, in brain power, maybe they're lower, um, but in some ways that's not necessarily true. And also they, they are way more awesome than us in many other ways. Okay. Next we have bestiary. It is a noun from 1840. One, a medieval allegorical or moralizing work on the appearance and habits of real or imaginary animals. Two, a a collection of descriptions or representations of real or imaginary animals. To be an array of real humans or literary characters often having symbolic significance. Number three, an unusual or whimsical collection, as in a truly astounding bestiary of airplane designs. And that is a quote from Peter Garrison. Next we have bestir, transitive verb from the 14th century. To rouse to action. Get going. Get going, you, you go bestir. Best man is next. Two words, noun, from circa 1782. The principal groomsman at a wedding. I have never been a best man. Uh, I don't think I really want to. Um, I guess I've sort of been a co-best man, but or I don't even know if that's true. I think I was just one of the groomsmen. But there was only like two or three of us. Um, okay, next is bestow. It is a transitive verb from the 14th century. One, to put to use. Synonym is apply, as in bestowed his spare time on study. Number two, to put in a particular or appropriate place. Synonym is stow. Number three, to provide with quarters. A, a synonym is put up. Number four, to convey as a gift, usually used with the words on or upon. Synonym, synonym, if I enunciate, is the word give. Bestowal is a noun, and bestower is also a noun. Now we have bestrew, B-E-S-T-R-E-W. It is a transitive verb from before the 12th century. Number one, synonym is strew. And number two, to lie scattered over. Next is bestride. It is a transitive verb from before the 12th century. One, to ride, sit, or stand astride. Synonym is straddle. Number two, to tower over. Synonym is dominate, as in the bloated bureaucracy that bestrides us all. And that is a quote from Edward Ney, N-E-Y. And number three is archaic, to stride across. Next we have, oh, this will be the last word for this episode, best seller. Two words, best and seller. Noun from, oh, that would be the seller, S-E-L-L-E-R, not the seller, which is a basement. This is a noun from 1889, an article as a book whose sales are among the highest of its class. Best sellerdom is a noun and best selling is an adjective. Um, I think I may have forgotten to pick a word of the episode in the last episode. Um, so before I pick one for this one, I am going to pick Bessel function as the word in the last episode. And in this episode, I think I am going to pick uh, best boy as the word of the episode because I have always sort of wanted to be in the film, TV, whatever world, and that's sort of where I've gone with my life, and and uh, I'd like to be in it a bit more, and I'm slowly trying to figure that out. I guess that's why I'm doing a podcast. All right, that has been it. Thank you for listening. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the Dictionary Podcast. The first word is bet, B-E-T. It is the first form, a noun from 1592, 1A, something that is laid, staked, or pledged, typically between, whoa, what just happened? My cat fell off the window ledge and landed on their food plate.
okay, we are going to keep on going. I am not going to retake this because that is gold right there, people. All right, so the uh, 1A for bet is something that is laid, staked, or pledged typically between two parties on the outcome of a contest or a contingent issue. Synonym is wager, and this is often used figuratively in such phrases as all bets are off to stress the uncertainty of an outcome. 1B, the act of giving such a pledge. Oh, she's eyeing the windowsill again. She, she, see, there's an air conditioner in the window, and she likes to go sit on top of it and listen to the birds that are, have made a nest underneath it. Uh, but now she's afraid of the plate if she falls. Anyway, back to the words. Uh, let's see, number two, something to wager on. Three, a choice made by consideration of probabilities, as in your best bet is the back road. Why is that your best bet? Uh, now we have the second form of bet. It is a verb from 1597, starting with transitive. 1A, to stake on the outcome of an issue or the performance of a contestant. 1B, to make able to be sure that. To, to what? No, I think I read that wrong. To be able to be sure that. It's still a weird phrase. Uh, and that is usually used in the expression, you bet, as in, you bet I'll be there. Not during these times of self-quarantine. 2A, to maintain with or as if with a bet. 2B, to make a bet with. 2C, to make a bet on. And then we have one intransitive definition, to lay a bet. Now we have the third form of bet. It is an abbreviation for the word between. So would you pronounce the abbreviation as beat? I don't think so. Now we have the word beta, B-E-T-A. It is the first form, and all of the rest of the words will start with beta. Um, yeah. All right. This is chiefly British, this first one. It is a noun from the 14th century. One, the second... Oh, interesting. They write it 2-D instead of 2-N-D. Uh, the second letter of the Greek alphabet. And then it says to see the alphabet table. Number two, synonym is beta particle. Number three, a measure of the risk potential of a stock or an investment portfolio expressed as a ratio of the stocks or portfolio's volatility to the volatility of the market as a whole. Number four, a nearly complete prototype of a product as software, as in released in beta, also as in the beta version. So this is from Middle English, betha, from the Latin beta, which is from the Greek beta, which is of a sem origin, S-E-M. Is that Semitic? It's probably Semitic. Uh, of Semitic origin, akin to the Hebrew beth, B-E-T-H, uh, which means beth. Uh, we will get to that later, I guess. Um, now we have the second form of beta. It is an adjective from 1862. Second in position in the structure of an organic molecule from a particular group or atom, as in beta substitution. This is often used in combination. And the symbol for this is, um, I think this is the Greek letter beta. It looks like a B, like a capital B in our English alphabet, um, but the bottom left part of it sort of is a tail that goes down. Now we have beta adrenergic. Beta with a hyphen, and then A-D-R-E-N-E-R-G-I-C, adrenergic. Yeah, I think I pronounced that correctly. This is an adjective from 1959 of relating to or being a beta receptor, as in beta adrenergic blocking action. Now we have beta amyloid, beta hyphen A-M-Y-L-O-I-D. This is a noun from 1987, an amyloid that is derived from a larger precursor protein and is the primary component of plaques characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. Next, we have beta blocker, two words with a hyphen, noun from 1968, any of a class of drugs as propranolol. What? It goes over to the second line, so it's hard to read it all together propranolol that decrease the rate and force of heart contraceptions, uh, no, contractions, heart contractions, and lower high blood pressure by blocking the activity of beta receptors. Beta blocking is an adjective. Next, we have beta carotene, 
there is no carrots in this. It's that's not what it is. Uh, there is a hyphen though. Um, it is a noun from 1934, an isomer of carotene found in dark green and dark yellow vegetables and fruits. And and see, carrots are orange, so it doesn't it doesn't work. Now we have beta cell, two words, noun from 1926. Any of the insulin secreting pancreatic cells in the uh, islets or islets of Langerhans. Uh, I think I mentioned this before, but Weird Al has a great song about the pancreas, and all of those words are mentioned in it. Next, we have beta decay, two words, noun from 1931, a radioactive nuclear transformation governed by the weak force in which a nucleon, as a neutron, changes into a nucleon, as a proton, of the other type with the emission of either an electron and an antineutrino, or a positron and a neutrino. I feel like what I read was all sci-fi, but it's not. It's real life. Now we have beta endorphin, two words with a hyphen, noun from 1976, an endorphin in the pituitary gland having a much greater analgesic potency than morphine. Now we have beta globulin, two words, noun from 1943, any of several globulins or plasma of plasma or serum that have an alkaline pH electrophoretic mobilities intermediate between those of the alpha globulins and gamma globulins. That was a mouthful. I think we will do one more for this episode. It is beta glucan, beta hyphen G L U C A N. It is a noun from 1966. Any of several polysaccharides consisting of glucose units and including one found in endosperm cell walls of cereal grains as barley and oats. So what will be the word of the episode? Um, I didn't totally understand what most of these were. So we're just going to pick beta as the word of the episode. It's a thing you hear a lot in terms of, uh, you know, when you're saying the alphabet, you want to, you're over the phone and you say the letter B is beta or, um, uh, or, you know, a beta version of software. Anyway, it's a it's an important word. That is going to be it for this episode. If you are a regular listener or if you're a new listener, I do hope that you rate and review and share this so more people can learn lots of new words, because I know I am. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to this episode of the podcast. It's not yesterday's episode. It's not tomorrow's episode. It is this episode. Uh, We are going to have a lot of beta words again. Uh, Yeah, so let us talk about them. The first word is betaine. Yeah, I think that's how it's pronounced. B-E-T-A-I-N-E. The pronunciation guide says betaine, which is hard to say. It is a noun from 1875. A sweet crystalline quaternary ammonium salt, C5H11NO2, obtained especially from sugar beets. Also, it's hydrate or it's hydrochloride. Uh, So this is from the Latin word beta, which means beet. So it doesn't seem it's as related to all the other beta words. This is literally related to beets. Next, we have beta interferon. Two words, noun from 1980. An interferon produced especially by fibroblasts that is used in a form obtained from recombinant DNA, especially in the treatment of multiple sclerosis marked by recurrent attacks, yeah, attacks alternating with periods of remission, compared to alpha interferon and gamma interferon, different kinds of interferons. Now we have the word betake. It is a, f- a verb from the 14th century. Just transitive, I think. Number one is archaic. Synonym is commit. C-O-M-M-I-T. Number two, to cause oneself to go. So the definition is just to cause to go. Next we have beta lactamase. Beta hyphen L-A-C-T-A-M-A-S-E. Lactamase. It is a noun from 1965. An enzyme found especially in staphylococcal bacteria that inactivates the penicillins by hydrolyzing them. Fancy. Next, we have beta-oxidation. 
two words with a hyphen, noun from circa 1935, stepwise uh, catabolism cata- or catabolism, stepwise catabolism of fatty acids in which two carbon fragments are successfully removed from the carboxyl end of the chain. That was a mouthful. Next, we have beta particle, two words, noun from 1904, a high-speed electron, specifically one emitted by a radioactive nucleus in beta decay. Apologies for all these scientific words if that's not something you're interested in, but you know, every once in a while we get an interesting one. Now we have beta ray, two words, noun from 1902, one Synonym is beta particle, what we just read. Number two, a stream of beta particles, called also beta radiation. Next, we have beta receptor, two words with a hyphen. Noun from 1948, any of a group of receptors that are present on cell surfaces of some effector organs and tissues innervated by the sympathetic nervous system and that mediate certain physiological responses as vasodilation, relaxation of bronchial and uterine smooth muscle, and increased heart rate when bound by specific adrenergic agents, compared to the synonym alpha receptor. Uh, So there was a section in parentheses, those were examples, vasodilation, relaxation of bronchial and uterine, uh, smooth muscle, and increased heart rate. Next we have beta test, two words, noun from 1978, A field test of the beta version of a product, as software, especially by testers outside the company developing developing it, that is conducted prior to commercial release. Beta test is a transitive verb, and beta tester is a noun. Next, we have a hard word to say. It is beta hyphen thalassemia, thalassemia, T-H-A-L-A-S. S-E-M-I-A. It is a noun from 1962. Thalassemia, in which the longer hemoglobin chain is affected and which compromises Cooley's anemia in the hydro, no, homozygous condition and thalassemia minor in the heterozygous condition. Whoa. Next we have Betatron. Sounds like a robot. It is a noun from 1941. An accelerator in which electrons are propelled by the inductive action of a rapidly varying magnetic field. Next, we have beta wave. Two words. Noun from 1936. An electrical rhythm of the brain with a frequency of 13 to 30 cycles per second that is associated with normal conscious waking experience, called also beta or beta rhythm. What is, the, what is the frequency of my brain? I don't know. I don't think it's very good. Next, we have beetle. B-E-T-E-L. It is not the beetle that walks with the legs. We have talked about this before with other words that sound like beetle but are not, not spelled the same way. This is a noun from 1553. A climbing pepper. Peppers can climb? A climbing pepper of southeastern Asia whose leaves are chewed together with betel nut and mineral lime as a stimulant masticatory. Well, I know mastication is when you chew, so that's just a word related to that. This is a Portuguese word, betel, I'm not going to pronounce it, B-E-T-E-L-E, from a Tamil word, virali. Next we have, ooh, betel juice. Capital B-E-T-E-L-G-E-U-S-E. And uh, the pronunciation guide does say it is pronounced Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse. Noun from 1769, a variable red supergiant star of the first magnitude near the eastern shoulder of Orion. So this is a French word, Betelgeuse, from the Arabic word or words, Bait al-Jauza, which means Gemini, uh, or literally means the house of the twins. And this is confused with Orion. It's in parentheses. It says confused with Orion and Betelgeuse. I don't know, but I've said Betelgeuse many times, so I'm surprised that he hasn't shown up. Next, we have Beetle Nut. 
Beetle is the same spelling. It is two words, noun from 1673. The astringent seed of the beetle palm. And this is from its being chewed with beetle leaves. I think this is related to that first word, beetle. Now we have beetle palm, two words, noun from 1875. An Asian pinnate-leaved palm that has an orange-colored droop with an outer fibrous husk. Scientific name is Areca Katechu. Katechu. Next we have uh, Bet Noir, or it could be Bait Noir. It is two words. First word is B E T E, and the first E has that little carrot hat accent on it. And then the second word, Noir, N O I R E. This is a noun from 1828. A person or thing strongly detested or avoided. Synonym is bugbear, one word. Um, So this is French, obviously, and it literally means black beast. It's a person or thing strongly detested. Bait noir. I could think of some bait noirs. Um, Now we have the word, well, it looks like the word beth, B-E-T-H, but it is pronounced baith or bait or base. It is a noun from 1650, the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And then it says to see the alphabet table. So this is, yeah, Hebrew, uh, Beth or Beth from Baith, which means house. And now we have the last word for this episode. It is Bethel, B-E-T-H-E-L. It is a noun from circa 1617. One, a a hallowed spot. Number 2A, a chapel for nonconformists. 2B, a place of worship for seamen, like the Navy people. Um, yeah, this is Hebrew, Bethel, which means house of God. Um, well, we are going to pick Betel, Betel, Betelgeuse. Some say Betelgeuse, I guess. Uh, Betelgeuse as the word of the episode because it's a fun-sounding word, and it's a star, which is cool, and it's also um, the character, a crazy character in a movie, which if you haven't seen it, you should go see it. There are rumors that they're making a sequel. I don't know if I want them to. I don't know if I believe the rumors. It has potential, but I'm also not... uh, I don't have high hopes if they do actually make it. That is going to be it for this episode. Thank you very much for joining. Um, I don't know what the world is like on uh, May 11th, but I'm recording this still in April. Um, I know here in Illinois, the uh, shelter in place has been moved to May 31st. Um, so yeah, I just, I hope you're all doing well, staying strong. And this has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the podcast called The Dictionary. Ooh, my cats are playing. I wonder if they're going to start running around. Okay. The first word is bethink, B-E-T-H-I-N-K. Um, It is a verb from before the 12th century. 1A, synonyms are remember and recall. 1B, to cause oneself to be reminded. Number two, to cause oneself to consider. Uh, Those were all transitive. Now we have the word betide. It is a verb from the 12th century. To happen, especially as if by fate. And that was intransitive. Now we have transitive. To happen to. Synonym is befall. Used chiefly in the phrase, woe betide. um, As in, woe betide our enemies. Now we have betimes. It is an adverb from the 13th century. One, in good time. Synonym is early. Number two is archaic. In a short time. Synonym is speedily. Number three, at times. Synonym is occasionally. Now we have Betis. It is spelled B-E-T-I-S-E. And there is a little uh, carrot accent on the first E. It is a noun from uh, 1798. Um, Let's see. Number one, an act of foolishness or stupidity. Wow, this word describes me very well. Number two, lack of good sense. Synonym is stupidity. This is French from uh, bete, which means idiot or fool, or it literally means beast. 
Next, we have betoken. It is a verb, transitive verb, from the 15th century. One, to typify beforehand. Synonym is presage. I think that's how it's pronounced, maybe. P-R-E-S-A-G-E. Number two, to give evidence of. Synonym is show. Next is betray. It is a verb from the 13th century. We are starting with transitive. One, to lead astray, especially the synonym seduce. Number two, to liver, to liver, to deliver to an enemy by treachery. Number three, to fail or desert, especially in time of need, as in betrayed his family. For A, to reveal unintentionally, as in betray one's true feelings. For B, synonyms are show and indicate. For C, to disclose in violation of confidence, as in betray a secret. Now we have the intransitive definition. Uh, there's just one, to prove false. And then at the end, we have the synonym as reveal. Betrayal is a noun, and betrayer is also a noun. And uh, let's see, this is from Middle English, from B plus trayen, which means to betray. From Anglo-French, trahir, which is from the Latin verb tradere, and there's more at the word traitor. Now we have the word betroth. It is a transitive verb from the 14th century. One, to promise to marry. Number two, to give in marriage. So this is from Middle English, B plus trouth, T-R-O-U-T-H-E, which means truth or troth. I don't know what troth is, but it's probably similar to truth. Now we have betrothal. It is a noun from 1831. One, the act of betrothing or fact of being betrothed. Number two, a mutual promise or contract for a future marriage. Now we have the word betrothed with an ed at the end. It is a noun from 1588. The person to whom one is betrothed. The, the, I betroth you to be, be, be my betrothed in our betrothal. Now we have the word beta, B-E-T-T-A. It is a noun from 1927. Any of a genus of small, brilliantly colored, long-finned, freshwater bony fishes of southeastern Asia, especially the synonym Siamese fighting fish. Uh, that must be an old name because I can't imagine there would be something called the Siamese fighting fish anymore. Uh, this is from New Latin, probably from the Java word wader, W-A-D-E-R, which is a freshwater fish. And the genus is Beta of the family Anabontidae. I am feeling a little low energy, but I'm also feeling like these words aren't terribly fascinating. And sorry if some of these episodes are not quite as interesting as other episodes. But that is what you get. Okay, uh, now we have the word better. B-E-T-T-E-R. It is the first form of... And we are going to read two of them in this episode. So this is the last word of this episode. It is an adjective. It says comparative of the word good. And it is from before the 12th century. One, greater than half. As in, for the better part of an hour. Number two, improved in health or mental attitude. Uh, as in, feeling better. Number three, more attractive, favorable, or commendable, as in, in better circumstances. Number four, more advantageous or effective, as in, a better solution. Number five, improved in accuracy or performance, as in, building a better engine. This is from Middle English, betra, from Old English, betera, akin to the Old English, bot, which means remedy, from the Sanskrit badra, which means fortunate. Wasn't that interesting? Now we have the second form of better. This will be the last one that we do. It is a verb, a transitive verb from before the 12th century. One, to make better, as 1a, to make more tolerable or acceptable, 
as in trying to better the lot of slum dwellers. Trying to better the lot of slum dwellers. That seems like it should be a quote, but it doesn't say. 1B, to make more complete or perfect, as in looked forward to bettering her acquaintance with the new neighbors. That is, nobody is talking to anybody's neighbors these days. Uh, number two, to surpass in excellence. Synonym is excel. Oh, and here we have an intransitive definition. It is to become better. Synonym is the word improve. Well, I am going to pick this French word, uh, bêtise. I think maybe I said bêtise before, but the emphasis is on the second syllable, bêtise, uh, because that one describes me very well. Uh, foolishness and stupidity and, yep, sounds right. Um, that is going to be it for this episode. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. We are still going strong. Today, I think, is May 13th. But not as I am saying it. It is May 1st. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. The first word is better. B-E-T-T-E-R. Not butter. That's something different. Uh, this is the third form um, adverb from the 12th century. 1A, in a more excellent manner. Uh, that sounds like something that you would hear in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. As in, sings better than I do. 1B, to greater advantage. Syn- synonym is preferably. As in, some things are better left unsaid. Yes, that is true. 2A, to a higher or greater degree, as in, he knows the story better than you do. Ooh, them's fighting words. For B, synonym is more, as in, it is better than nine miles to the next town. That word is a comparative of the word well. Now we have the fourth form of better. It is a noun from the 12th century. 1A, something better. Well, yeah, as in, I expected better from them. 1B, a superior, especially in merit or rank, as in, he was respectful of his betters. Number two, synonym, uh, synonyms, plural, are advantage and victory, as in, get the better of her. Now we have the, f- the last form of better. It is the fifth one, verbal auxiliary, from 1831, had better, as in, you better hurry. Now we have better half. Two words, noun from 1580. Synonym is spouse. My better half is absolutely my better half. She's actually probably my better 90%. Maybe 95 or more. Uh, That is a fact. Next we have betterment. It is a noun from 1598. One, a making or becoming better. Number two. An improvement that adds to the value of a property or facility. Next, we have better off with a hyphen. Adjective from circa 1859. One, being in comfortable economic circumstances. As in, the better off people live in the older section of town. The second form is being, no, the second definition, being in a more advantageous position. Next is better shop. Two words, noun from 1852. It is British, and it means a shop where bets are taken. Well, yeah, they would call it a betting shop. It's very obvious, and it's to the point, you know. You don't need anything. It's it's a betting office, betting shop. Next, we have better, B-E-T-T-O-R, or B-E-T-T-E-R, um... Even though that one, the second one, comes earlier in uh, alphabetical order, I think it's the less common usage, which is why they put the OR version first. This is a weird podcast. It is also a noun from 1609, one that bets, the bettor. Now we have the word between. It is the first form, and there is a bunch of definitions and a bunch of usage information. It is a preposition from... Before the 12th century, 1A, by the common action of jointly engaging, as in shared the work between the two of them. I forgot what the word was. Also as in talks between the three. 
That is a quote from Time. Time Magazine, that is a weird quote. Talks between the three. Okay. Uh, 1B. In common to, shared by, as in, divided between his four grandchildren. What did they get? Was it an onion? They got to divide the onion four ways? Ooh. To A, in the time, space, or interval that separates. To B, an intermediate relation to. 3A, from one to another of, as in, air service between Miami and Chicago. 3B, serving to connect or unite in a relationship, as difference, likeness, or proportion. As in, a one-to-one correspondence between sets. I like that game set. I've mentioned it before. I want to play it. Uh, 3C. Setting apart, as in, the line between fact and fancy. See, that seems like that should be a quote from somewhere. 4A, in preference for one or the other of, as in, had no difficulty deciding between the two. Next, we have 4B, in point of com- 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 in point of comparison of, as in, not much to choose between the two coats. Not much to choose between the two coats. Am I going crazy, or are these examples getting stranger and stranger? By the time we get to Z, it'll just be all-out gibberish. Okay, five. In confidence restricted to, as in, a secret between you and me. Six. Taking together the combined effect of, as in, but uh, between work and family life, they have no time for hobbies. Oh, well, that is sad. I want my hobbies to be my work. This, uh, well, I guess we'll, uh, this in person, we can skip the etymology. Okay, usage. There is a persistent but unfounded notion that between can be used only in two items and that among, the word among, must be used for, used for more than two. Between has been used of more than two since Old English. This is like a history lesson in here. It is especially appropriate to denote a one-to-one relationship regardless of the number of items. It can be used when the number is unspecified, as in economic cooperation between nations. When, so that was, it can be used in one, that example. Next example, when more than two are enumerated, as in between you and me and the lamppost. Also as in partitioned between Austria, Prussia, and Russia, That is a quote from Nathaniel Benchley. And then also you can use it. It says, and even when only one item is mentioned, but repetition is implied, as in pausing between every sentence to wrap the floor. That is a quote from George Eliot. Now, the word among is more appropriate where the emphasis is on distribution rather than individual relationships, as in discontent among the peasants. When among is automatically chosen for more than two, English idiom may be strained. Well, we wouldn't want to strain it. As in, a worthy book that nevertheless falls among many stools. Uh, That is a quote from John Simon. Also as in, the author alternates among mod slang, cliches, and quotes from literary giants. That is a quote from A.H. Johnston, a writer talking about a writer. Okay, that is it for the first form of between. Um, We just have a few more, don't worry. Second form of between, adverb, from before the 12th century, in an intermediate space or interval. Betweenness, noun, from 1884, the quality or state of being between two others in an ordered mathematical set. Next is between times, one word, adverb, from 1580, at or during intervals. Between whiles, whoa, that is a strange, strange word. This is an adverb or a preposition from before the 12th century. Uh, Synonym is between. This is from Middle English, from Old English, betwux. Ooh, that's a fun word, betwux. Uh, That is from B plus twux. Twux is a word, people. It is an Old English word. What does it mean? Akin to the Gothic twainai. Twainai, which means two each. So maybe twux is two. Yeah, it, it's sort of like that word betwixt. They ate them both betwixt, you see. And that could be. That's, um, you know, the skinny guy. Oh, my sister is going to kill me because she had a whole thing about this. Um, Jack Spratt. 
Jack Spratt and his wife. Okay. I think that word betwixt is in there. So that's where twux came from. Moving on. Betwixt. Oh, see, it's right there. Betwixt and between. Adverb or adjective. See, I proved myself. I really do not look ahead. Uh, This is from 1789. In a midway position. Neither one thing nor the other. And the last word is Beulah, capital B-E-U-L-A-H, Beulah, noun from 1684, an idyllic land near the end of life's journey in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress, I get, I guess. Well, that sounds like a very good word of the episode, an idyllic land near the end of life's journey. Maybe I should read Pilgrim's Progress. No clue what it is. That is going to be it. Thank you for this wonderful episode. And this has been Spencer Dispensing Information. See, it's my name. It's what I'm supposed to do, I guess. Okay, bye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to this episode of the Dictionary Podcast. The first word is burblanc. Burblanc. I don't think you should say the C sound at the end. It is spelled B-E-U-R-R-E. Next word, B-L-A-N-C. It is a noun from 1931. A seasoned butter sauce, as for fish, flavored with white wine, shallots, and vinegar or lemon juice. It is French, literally means white butter. Beurre blanc. Now we have beurre manie. Beurre, again, second word, M-A-N-I-E, with an accent over the E. It is noun. It is a noun from 1939. Flour and butter kneaded together, used as a thickener in sauces. And this is French again, and it literally means handled butter. So you've handled your butter very nicely and made it into a thickener. I'm assuming burr means butter. B-E-U-R-R-E. Next we have burr noir. Burr again, N-O-I-R. It is a noun from 1830. Butter heated until brown or black and often flavored with vinegar or lemon juice. And this French phrase literally means black butter. First one was white butter. This one is black butter. Now we have BEV, capital B, capital V, abbreviation for billion electron volts. Now we have BEV again, but they are all capitalized. This is an abbreviation for black English vernacular. Uh, Now we have bevel, B-E-V-E-L, first form, adjective from circa 1600. Synonyms are oblique and beveled, as in a bevel edge. Now we have the second form of bevel. It is a noun from 1610. Number one, an instrument consisting of two rules or arms jointed together and opening to any angle for drawing angles or adjusting surfaces to be cut at an angle. 2a. The angle that one surface or line makes with another when they are not at right angles. 2b. The slant of such a surface or line. Number 3. The part of printing type, the part of printing type extending from face to shoulder. This is from uh, the old French bevel from baif, b a i f which means with open mouth from bear to, which means to yawn. And there's more at the word abeyance. Now we have the third form of bevel. This is the verb form from 1677. Transitive is first, to cut or shape to a bevel. And then the intransitive definition just has the synonyms incline and slant. Now we have bevel gear, two words, noun from circa 1790, either of a pair of toothed wheels whose working surfaces are inclined to non-parallel axes. Now we have the word beverage. It is a noun from uh, the 14th century, a drinkable liquid. That is what it is. This is from Anglo-French bivre. Bivre, B-E-I-V-R-E, which means to drink. That is from the Latin bibere, and I think that means to drink. And there's more at the word potable, like drinkable. That is a tasty beverage. Now we have bevy. It is a noun from the 15th century. One, a large group or collection, as in a bevy of girls. What a weird example. 
Number two, a group of animals and especially quail. So the group name for quail is probably a bevy. Now we have bewhale. Bewhale. It is, uh, oh, I should probably spell it because whale sounds like whale. B-E-W-A-I-L. It is a verb from the 14th century. Only transitive. Number one, to wail over. Number two, to express deep sorrow for, usually by wailing and lamentation. Synonym is the word deplore. Now we have beware. It is a verb from the 14th century. We are starting with the intransitive definitions. To be on one's guard, as in beware of the dog. Now we have transitive. There was just one intransitive, now it's transitive. Number one, to take care of, as in beware your wallet. Number two, to be wary of, as in we must beware the exceedingly tenuous generalization. That is a quote from Matthew Lipman. Uh, now we have the word bewhiskered. It is an adjective from 1820, having whiskers. Next is bewigged. B-E-W-I-G-G-E-D. It is an adjective from 1774, wearing a wig. Next is bewilder. It is a transitive verb from 1684. One to cause to lose one's bearings. Number two, to perplex or confuse, especially by a complexity, variety, or multitude of objects or considerations. Synonym is the word puzzle. Bewilderedly is an adverb. Bewilder bewilderedness, there's a bewilderedness, there's a D in there, is a noun. And bewilderingly is an adverb. Now we have bewilderment. It is a noun from 1811. One, the quality or state of being bewildered. Number two, a bewildering tangle or confusion. Next is bewitch. It is a transitive verb from the 13th century. And again, it's just a verb, but we are starting with transitive. 1a, to influence or affect especially injuriously by witchcraft. 1b, to cast a spell over. Number two, to attract as if by the power of witchcraft. Synonyms are enchant and fascinate, as in bewitched by her beauty. Now we have the intransitive definition, one of them, to bewitch someone or something. Bewitchery is a noun and bewitchingly is an adverb. And we have the last word for this episode. It is bewitchment. B-E-W-I-T-C-H-M-E-N-T. -E it is a noun from 1607. 1A, the act or power of bewitching. 1B, a spell that bewitches. And number two, the state of being bewitched. Well, we are going to pick beverage as the word of the episode because I could use a beverage. That is it for this episode. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the Dictionary Podcast. Let us talk about some of the words, starting with the word beray. B-E-W-R-A-Y. <clears throat> Excuse me. I <clears throat> got a thing caught in my throat. This is a verb from the 13th century. It is archaic. Synonyms are divulge and betray. It is transitive, by the way. This is from Middle English, B plus rayen, which means to accuse, from Old English regen, which is akin to the Old High German raugen, which means to accuse. Next, we have bay, B-E-Y. I don't think we are going to see the definition um, that we've of the word bay that has become very popular in the last few years, uh, because I think this book was made before that word became a thing. Uh, so this is a noun from 1537. 1A, a provincial governor in the Ottoman Empire. 1B, the former native ruler of Tunis or Tunisia. Number two, used as a courtesy title in Turkey and Egypt. Uh, so yeah, this is a Turkish word. It means gentleman or chief. Next we have beyond. It is the first form adverb from before the 12th century. One, on or to the farther side. 
synonym is farther. Number two, in addition, synonym is besides. This is from Old English beyond, uh, begyonden, from b be plus gyonden, which means beyond, from gyond, which means yond, and there's more at the word yond, like yonder. And now we have the second form of beyond. It is a preposition from before the 12th century. One, on or to the farther side of, at a greater distance than, as in beyond the horizon. I don't think there's anything beyond the horizon. I think the world just ends there. 2A, out of reach or out of the reach or sphere of, as in a task beyond his strength. 2B, in a degree or amount surpassing, as in beautiful beyond measure. 2C, out of the comprehension of, as in his reasoning is beyond me. Well, maybe that's because you just think differently. Number three, in addition to, synonym is besides, as in doing work beyond his regular duties. Now we have the third form of beyond. It is a noun from the 14th century. One, something that lies beyond. Number two, something that lies outside the scope of ordinary experience, specifically the synonym hereafter. Next is, and we're going to see some, uh, the next four words are interesting. Um, the ne this next one is Byzant or Byzant. B-E-Z-A-N-T. It is a noun from the 13th century. One, uh, we have the number one definition for the word solidus. S-O-L-I-D-U-S. Number two, a flat disc used in architectural ornament. I feel like I need to see a picture of this. Uh, let's see, this is from Middle English, Byzant, from Middle Latin, Byzantius, which, is, uh, which means Byzantine, from Byzantium, which is an ancient name of Istanbul, not Constantinople. Now we have the word bezel or basil, B-E-Z-E-L. It is a noun from 1611. One, a rim that holds a transparent covering, as on a watch, clock, or headlight, or that is rotatable and has special markings, as on a watch. Number two, the oblique side or face of a cut gem, specifically the upper faceted portion of a brilliant projecting from the setting. And then it says to see the brilliant illustration. That is not a word that I would have... Exp oh, an illustration, yeah, I was thinking like a chart. Uh, so that's... But that's still an interesting word to have an illustration of, because... It's a, an adjective the way my mind likes to think of it. We're not going to see that one for a while. Um, okay, now where were we? Number three, a usually metal rim of a piece of jewelry in which an ornament, as a gem, is set. So this is probably from a dialectic form of the French word bisseau, which means bezel or bezel, uh, and that is good for that. Now we have bezique, B-E-Z-I-Q-U-E, bezique. Uh, it is a noun from uh, 1861. Is this? Is, does the nickname Zeke come from this? No, I don't think so. A card game similar to uh, pin. Wait, why well, I know this word? Pinocle. Pinocle. P i n o c h l e. I feel like I know it, but my brain is not seeing what that is. A card game similar to Pinocle that is played with a pack of 64 cards. Pinochle, I think, is is that is that how you spell it? Pinochle? I always thought that was different. It might be Pinochle. Audrey, don't do that. Don't claw the screen. Stop it. Stop it. Hey, don't claw the screen. Thanks. Okay, that is Bezik. Fascinating. Now we have Bezor. Bezor, B-E-Z-O-A-R. It is a noun from 1577. Any of various calculi found chiefly in the gastrointestinal organs and formerly believed to possess magical properties. <clears throat> bezor? Called also bezor stone. This is from an Arabic dialect, bizuar, from Arabic a bazaar, from the Persian podsar, which is from pod, which means protecting against, plus zar, which means poison. Protecting against poison. Interesting. 
what is a calculi? I don't know. Next, we have, we are in the abbreviation section, BF, lower, all lowercase. It is uh, an abbreviation for bold face. Next, we have BF again, all caps, abbreviation for one, Bachelor of Forestry, two, Board Foot, and three, Brought Forward. Now we have BFA, all caps, abbreviation for Bachelor of Fine Arts. Next is BFF, all caps, abbreviation for, whoa, they have this in here? Best friends forever. Guess so. Uh, yeah. Now we have BG, all lowercase, abbreviation for one, background, two, bag. Why do you need to abbreviate bag? It's only three letters long. Three, beige, four, bean. Now we have BG again, it is all caps, or it could be B, second word, G-E-N, with a capital G. This is an abbreviation for Brigadier General. Next, we have B-G-H. It is an abbreviation for Bovine Growth Hormone. Next is B-Girl, capital B hyphen girl, noun from 1936. A woman who entertains bar patrons and encourages them to spend freely. This is probably um, basically from the words bar girl. They changed it to B girl. This seems um, sketchy to me. I don't know. We are going to move on to BGS, all caps, abbreviation for Bachelor of General Studies. Next is BH with a capital B. It is a symbol for Borium, B-O-H-R-I-U-M. Next is B-H, all caps, abbreviation for one, Bill of Health, and two, Brinell Hardness. Brinell is capital B-R-I-N-E-L-L. It must be some sort of scale of how hard something is. Uh, Diamonds must be at the top of that scale, right? Now we have B-H-A, all caps, noun from 1950. A phenolic antioxidant, antioxidant C11H16O2, used especially to preserve fats and oils in food. This is from butylated hydroxa, hydroxyanisole. Hydroxyanisole. They got the B and the H and the A. Now we have Bhagavad Gita, capital B H A G A V A D. Second word, capital G-I-T-A. It is a noun from circa 1785. A Hindu devotional work in poetic form. I have a feeling it's from much more bef- much earlier than 1785, but that's when it became uh, known in the English language. This is a Sanskrit word, Bhagavad Gita. Literally means song of the blessed one, and the blessed one is Krishna. Now, we have the last word for this episode. It is bhakti, B-H-A-K-T-I. It is a noun from 1832. Devotion to a deity constituting a way to salvation in Hinduism. This is a Sanskrit word, and it literally means portion, P-O-R-T-I-O-N, like a portion of that for you and a portion of that for you. Um, I like that I that we're seeing, you know, other other cultures words in here we you know we see that you know with even with french uh judaism hebrew words and stuff um i know i've complained a lot about the the large amount of catholic christian words in here but i love seeing things like bhagavad gita and bhakti um so I'm, i think i'm gonna pick bhagavad gita as the word of the episode i aren't i'm not too familiar with it um i would like to learn a little bit more about what it is what it consists of what is what is said in it um i i want to learn more about lots of different uh uh, religions and spiritual um uh, ideas throughout the world because i just think that they're kind of interesting so that's one that i could learn more about that is the word of the episode uh this has been spencer dispensing information thank you and goodbye Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of the podcast called The Dictionary. We are at the top of page 118 for those who are keeping track. Um, Yeah, so let us talk about the words. The first word is bong. 
B-H-A-N-G. It is a noun from 1563. A mildly intoxicating preparation of the leaves and flowering tops of uncultivated hemp. Also, the 1A definition for hemp, the word hemp, uh, and it looks like also the 1C definition for the word hemp. And then it says compare to the word marijuana, or also hashish. Uh, This is a Hindi word, bang, plus an Urdu word, bang. They have uh, very, very similar words. The the Hindi word has uh, a couple of accents on it. The Urdu word does not. Uh, And those both uh, mean hemp. Um, and um, uh, how many, two, three, three or so weeks ago, I mentioned that I actually have another podcast uh, where I have interviewed people about um, what it's like to be high on the marijuana. Uh, I'm just trying to be silly. Uh, but I do actually have that podcast, so this is, uh, this is relevant to that. Um, okay, next we have Bhangra, B-H-A-N-G-R-A. It is a noun from 1965. Popular dance music originating chiefly in England that combines traditional Punjabi music with elements of disco and hip hop. So, this is from the Punjabi word uh, Bamgra. There's an M, not an N, Bamgra, which is a kind of folk dance. Maybe I can find an audio example of this. Next, we have Barrel, uh, Barrel, Barrel something like that. B-H-A-R-A-L. It is a noun from 1838. Any of a genus of goat-like bovid ant- mammals of the Himalayas and western China having a bluish gray coat. Uh, bovid, I assume, is uh, c- related to cows, so a goat-like cow mammal, maybe? We got to find a picture of this guy. Uh, and a genus name is Pseudois. P-S-E-U-D-O-I-S. Next, we have B-H-C, all caps, noun, from 1946. One, any of several stereoisometric, no, stereoisomeric chlorine derivatives, C6H6Cl6, of cyclohexane, in which the chlorine atoms are all attached to different carbon atoms. Number two, synonym is Lindane or Lindane, L-I-N-D-A-N-E. This is uh, BHC is from benzene hexachloride. Next is BHD, all lowercase, abbreviation for bulkhead. And I feel a sneeze possibly coming on. Next we have BHL, all caps, abbreviation for one, Bachelor of Hebrew Letters. I had no idea that there would be a Bachelor of Hebrew Letters. But this next one makes more sense to me. Number two, Bachelor of Hebrew Literature. Both are acceptable. Next, we have BHN, all caps, abbreviation for Brunel Hardness Number. And that is similar to one of the last ones we had in the last episode. Uh, Now we have uh, Bopuri, or Bajpuri, BH. O-J-P-U-R-I, with a capital B. This is a noun. Oh, I think I forgot to mention... Oh, uh, barrel, barrel, uh, that is a Hindi word. I forgot to mention that before. All right, so Bajpuri is a noun from 1884. An Indo-Aryan language spoken in Western Bihar, or Bihar, and Eastern Uttar Pradesh in India. This is a Hindi word, Bhojpuri, from Bhojpur, which is a village in Bihar. And, uh, of course, apologies for mispronunciations. I think we are well past that. I have mispronounced many, many of these words. Next, we have B Horizon. The first word is just a capital B. Noun from 1938. A subsurface soil layer that is immediately beneath the A horizon from which it obtains organic matter chiefly by illuviation, not illumination, but illuviation, and is usually distinguished distinguished by less weathering. Next we have BHP, lowercase, abbreviation for bishop. Next is BHT, all caps. It is a noun from 1961. A phenolic antioxidant, C15, H24O, used especially to preserve fats and oils in food. 
This is butylated hydroxytoluene. Next, we have the word bi, B-I. Um, so there's a few different... So this is just the word. The next couple are prefixes. So this one is a noun or an adjective from 1956, and we have the synonym bisexual, which I think is um, just really within the last couple of years, maybe that is not the appropriate word anymore, uh, from what I understand. Now we have the prefix bi, B-I. It is the first form. It is, um, oh yeah, it's just a prefix, and it also doesn't give me a year. 1A, it's just the word two. That's the definition, two, which uh, as in bilateral. 1B, coming or occurring every two, as in bicentennial. 1C, into two parts. Synonym is bisect. 2A, twice or doubly or on both sides, as in biconvex. 2B, coming or occurring two times, as in biannual. Compare to the uh, prefix semi, semi-annual. Uh, number three, between, involving, or affecting two specified symmetrical parts, and specified was in parentheses, as in bilabial. 4a, containing one, uh, am I missing a line? No, containing one specified constituent in double the proportion of the other constituent or in double the ordinary proportion. My brain shut off. I did not even know what I was reading. Uh, as in bicarbonate. For B, we have the number two definition for the prefix di, di, uh, as in biphenyl. This is a Middle English from Latin, and it just says there's more at the prefix twi, T-W-I. All right, now we have some usage information for this prefix. Many people are puzzled about bi-monthly and bi-weekly, which are often ambiguous because they are formed from both senses 1B and 2B of the prefix bi. This amb ambiguity has been in existence for nearly a century and a half and cannot be eliminated by the dictionary. Ooh. The chief difficulty is that many users of these words assume that others know exactly what they mean, and they do not bother to make their context clear. Oh, you gotta have context. You gotta have context. So, if you need bi-monthly or bi-weekly, you should leave some clues in your context to the sense of bi you mean. And if you need... It's a block of text and I get confused. And if you need the meaning, quote, twice A, you can substitute semi for bi. Oh, that's the end of the sentence. Biannual and biennial are usually differentiated. Uh, so don't get confused by bi-monthly and bi-weekly or it is easily confused. Uh, so pay attention or ask questions or if you are the person using them, give some extra context because I, what I'm understanding is it could be bi-weekly, could be um, every other week, basically, which would be essentially twice a month, or bi-monthly could be twice a month. See, that's where the confusion is. Bi-weekly could also be twice a week. Bi-monthly could be every other month. Moving on to the next form of bi, it is also bio, B-I-O. It is um, number one, life, living organisms or tissue as in bioluminescence or biosphere. Number two, biographical. That's the definition for number two, and the example is biopic or biopic. I always, I say both in my head. I think it's biopic, though. Uh, so this is from Greek, the word bios, which, is me, which means mode of life, and there's more at the word quick, which I still don't understand why. All right, I think we are going to do a couple more now we have the symbol bi, capital B-I, and that is a symbol for bismuth, B-I-S-M-U-T-H. Next is B-I-A, all caps. This is the last one for this episode. It is an abbreviation for one, Bachelor of Industrial Administration, and number two, Bureau of Indian Affairs. And what is going to be the word of the episode? Well, I think I will probably pick... Um, ba, ba, ba. I will pick bang, the first word, as the word of the episode. I hope you are all doing well. 
And, you know, this is airing on May 16th or something. Uh, Illinois officially has been pushed back to May 31st or through May 31st in terms of our sheltering in place. I would not be surprised if it goes past that or well past that uh, because, you know, things aren't really getting better. Um, all right, that is all I have to say to you. I hope you go and you do the rating and the reviewing. It really does help. Uh, five stars, but then, you know, say, give me some constructive criticism if you want. I may or may not listen to it. Um, what else? Uh, share, share, share. Please tell all the other people about it. Um, and until next time, this has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. We have to move my chair. Oh, there we go. All right, now I am closer to the book. Which book is this? It's The Dictionary. That's the podcast you're listening to. Thank you for joining me. How are you all doing? I hope you're doing well. Yep, still still sheltering in place. Um, I think this episode is in, uh, yeah, we're still in the middle of May. This is May 17th. Uh, this page, 118, is a little weird um, because there is a whole big chart on the second column. And so... Um, you know, instead of doing four episodes for one page, I'm dividing it up uh, a little bit weirdly. Um, same for the next page. Do you, do you really care about this stuff? Probably not. All right. The first word for this episode is Bialy. B-I-A-L-Y. It is a noun from 1965. A flat breakfast roll that has a depressed center and is usually covered with onion flakes. Um, a lot of you may not know what this is. Uh, I grew up in a half Jewish household, so Bialis were something that were sort of around, or at least, you know, they were spoken about. Um, but yeah, that would, I, yeah, I'll post a picture of one of these, one of these things. It looks kind of like a bagel. They're good. It is Yiddish, short for Bialystoker. Uh, I, I'm guessing that's how it's pronounced, but I'm probably wrong. I didn't know it was short for anything. Uh, that is from Bialystoker, which is of Bialystok, which is, oh, it's a city in Poland. I'm sure it's not pronounced that way. Uh, that's very cool. I had no idea. Next, we have biannual. It is an adjective from 1877. One, occurring twice a year. Number two is the number one definition for the word biennial. Usage says, uh, see the prefix bi, which was at the end of the last episode. And biannually is an adverb. Next, we have the word bias, B-I-A-S. It is the first form noun from 1530. One, a line diagonal to the grain of a fabric. Especially, a line at a 45-degree angle to the selvage, S-E-L-V-A-G-E, often utilized in the cutting of garments for smoother fit. 2A, a peculiar... A peculiarity in the shape of a bowl that causes it to swerve when rolled on the green in lawn bowling. Lawn bowling? That's not, um, what is that game called where I feel like you, they play it all the time in Italy. Uh, they throw the thing and you're trying to get the thing closer. I can't think of it. I'm My brain is broken. Um, I don't know if that's what it is. Anyway, 2B, the tendency of a bowl to swerve. Also, the impulse causing this tendency. 2C, the swerve of the bowl. 3A, synonyms are bent and tendency. 3B, an inclination of temperament or outlook, especially a personal and sometimes unreasoned judgment. Synonym is prejudice. 3C, an instance of such prejudice. 3D1, Deviation of the expected value of a statistical estimate from the quantity it estimates. 3D2. Systematic error introduced into sampling or testing by selecting or encouraging one outcome or answer over others. There's a bias. That's the word we're talking about. 4A. A voltage applied to a device as a transistor control electrode to establish a reference level for operation. 4B, a high-frequency voltage combined with an audio signal to reduce distortion in tape recording. Synonym for after all of these definitions is the word predilection. We have a phrase, on the bias. Synonyms for that one are askew 
and obliquely. Um, not much in the term in the ways of etymology. Moving on to the second form of bias, it is an adjective from 1551. Synonyms are diagonal and slanting. It is used chiefly of fabrics and their cut. Biasness is a noun. Lots of s sounds. Now we have the third form of bias. It is an adverb from fif- from 1575. One synonym is diagonally, as in cut cloth bias. Number two is obsolete, and we have the synonym awry. Now we have the fourth and final form of bias. It is a verb from circa 1628. One, to give a settled and often prejudiced outlook to, as in his background, his background biases, biases, boy, how do you say this? His background biases him against foreigners. Uh, it went over to the second line, so I couldn't look ahead to see what the words were to, words were to see how I should say this phrase. His background biases him against foreigners. Foreigners, uh, I, I'm not a fan of that. Number two, to apply a slight negative or positive voltage to as a trans- transistor. Synonym is the word incline. Now we have bias belted tire. Bias belted is hyphenated and then tire is its own word. This is a noun from 1968. A pneumatic tire with a belt as of steel or fiberglass, to help prevent punctures that is under the tread and on top of the plies of cord, uh, cords which form the tire's carcass and which are set diagonally to the center line of the tread. No clue what any of that means. Now we have bias crime, two words, noun from 1982, and we have the synonym hate crime. Uh, so I assume in 1982 they said bias crime, and that has since... Uh, evolved to be hate crime, which is something, unfortunately, that we hear way too often. Now we have the word biased. Bias with an ed. Adjective from 1649. One, exhibiting or characterized by bias, especially the synonym prejudiced. Number two, tending to yield one outcome more frequently than others in a statistical experiment, as in a biased coin. Number three, having an expected value different from the quantity or parameter estimated, as in a biased estimate. Now we have, it's another tire one, bias ply tire. Bias and ply are hyphenated. This is a noun from 1968. A pneumatic tire having crossed plies of cords set diagonally to the center line of the tread. Um... All I can tell you is that bias belted tire has a much longer definition or a somewhat longer definition than bias ply tire, but I still don't understand what either of them are. Hey, if you know and you can explain it to me, um, honestly, it probably just takes me sitting or sitting with it for a little bit and thinking about it and maybe looking it up and looking at pictures. Uh, but if you want to explain the difference, go ahead and send me an email or a message on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or whatever, or call me. Now we have bias tape, two words, noun from 1915, a narrow strip of cloth cut on the bias, folded and used for finishing or decorating clothing. Next we have biathlete. It is a noun from 1968, somebody that I am not, an athlete who competes in a biathlon. Now we have biathlon. It is a noun from 1958. A composite athletic contest consisting of cross-country skiing and rifle sharpshooting. So, why is this specifically called a biathlon? I understand that it has two two sports, cross-country skiing and rifle sharpshooting, um, but why aren't there other biathlons? Why aren't there uh, things where you combine two other sports together? Um, Or are they? Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Uh, Okay, moving on to biaxial. It is an adjective from 1854, having or relating to two axes or optic axes, as in a biaxial crystal. Biaxially is an adverb. Now we have the word bib, B-I-B. I'm going to be saying that uh, syllable a lot uh, for the rest of this episode, pretty much. Uh, This is the first form. It is a verb from the 14th century. 
And we have the synonym drink. It's from Middle English bibbin. Now we have the second form of bib, noun from 1580. One, a cloth or plastic shield tied under the chin to protect the clothes. Number two, the part of an apron or of overalls extending above the waist. Number three, a patch of differently colored feathers or fur immediately below the bill or chin of a bird or mammal. Bibbed is an adjective and bibless is also an adjective. I feel like I probably could use a bib when I eat. Uh, I tend to get spots on my shirt. Not like every every time, um, but you know, maybe I wouldn't have to do laundry so often. Now we have the third form of bib. It is an abbreviation for one, Bible, or two, biblical. Now we have bib and tucker, three words, noun from 1747, an outfit of clothing usually used in the phrase best bib and tucker. Okay. Now we have bibber. It is a noun from 1536, a person who regularly drinks alcoholic beverages. Bibbery is a noun. They really call people bibbers? Seriously? Okay. Now we have bib lettuce. Two words. Bib is capital B-I-B-B. It is a noun from 1961. A butter lettuce of a variety that has a small head and dark green color, called also just bib. So this is from Major John Bib, who was a a 19th century American grower. He was such an amazing grower of foods and such that they named a whole lettuce after him. Maybe he uh, genetically modified it. Maybe he created this butter lettuce. Also, why is it called a butter lettuce? Now we have... Uh, oh, this is the last word of the episode. It is be below. Be below. B I B E L O T. Noun from 1873. I love it when they rhyme. A small household ornament or decorative object. Synonym is trinket. Be below. Yeah. I, you le- are, you, are you learning things? I hope you're learning things. If you are learning things, let me know. If there's anybody out there who wants to tell me something, say it. Um, Yeah, that is going to be the whole episode. Um, The next one, um, if you care to know, is all about the Bible. Uh, So, hey, it's in here. We're going to get through it. I am uh, not going to understand. It it may be a short-ish episode. We'll see. Not that that matters. Um, So, I think I'm going to pick bias as the word of the episode because... Um, uh, you know, I'm not going to deal with the fabric definitions or anything like that, but, um, you know, we, we all have biases, biases, and they can get you in trouble sometimes. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a thing that we all sort of have to learn to live with or r- at least recognize in yourself, um, and others and figure out how you can maybe not have so many biases, um, or understand that, you know, I don't know. You, you, I think you understand what I'm saying. We have positive biases, negative biases, uh, and, you know, just just take a look at those and see if you can figure out what they are and see if what you can do about them. Um, I'm sure I have a lot of them unconsciously, and, um, you know, that sucks. But I'm, uh, I'm trying to be more uh, conscious of that sort of thing. Okay, on that note... I hope you are enjoying this. Uh, I'm enjoying learning. It is extremely repetitive, but uh, I do do like learning all this stuff. That has been, this has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. Today, we have all Bible words. Um, And most of it is a big chart in the middle that describes the Bible, sort of. Um, yeah, I, I, I have never really read the Bible. I mean, I've read a couple of phrases, uh, here and there, but I am not familiar with it really at all. And, uh, so we're, we're just going to do it. The first word is Bible, B-I-B-L-E. It is a noun from, well, do you want to take a guess when it's from? Um, it says it's from the 14th century. When the word was actually coined, who knows? Number one, 
is capitalized, or uh, let's see, we've got one A and one B. Both of them are capitalized. The sacred scriptures of which, no, the sacred scriptures of Christians comprising the Old Testament and the New Testament. One B, the sacred scriptures of some other religion as Judaism. Number two is obsolete, and we just have the synonym book. So that's kind of interesting. Um, we'll get to the etymology in a bit. Um, okay, number three is also capitalized, a copy or an edition of the Bible. Number four, a publication that is preeminent, especially in authoritativeness or wide leadership, or readership, not leadership, as in the Fisherman's Bible. Also as in the Bible of the entertainment industry. So the etymology says, let's see, this is from Middle Latin Biblia, from Greek, uh, which is plural of the word Biblion, which means book. So if it's the plural form, then it's a lot of books. So it's made up of short books. I just think it's kind of interesting that it's basically the word for book. Uh, yeah, I never even thought about where did this word come from? Um, anyway, Biblion means a book. It is a diminutive of Biblos which means papyrus or book, from Byblos with a capital B, which is an ancient Phoenician city from which papyrus was exported. So that is where the word Bible comes from, which I think is really interesting. So now we get into the books of the Bible chart. This is divided into one, two, three, I guess it's four sections here. Um, as I'm looking at the size of the text, um, but one of them looks like it's maybe a subsection of the other one. Anyway, we're just going to go read it. The first section, the first book, is the Hebrew Bible. And it lists all of the different things. So the first list is law. That's in italics. And the uh, ones under that are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now we have the prophets. Joshua, Judges, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. Is that how you pronounce it? Ooh, get into some words that I am not familiar with. Uh, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So those were the prophets. Now we have the writings. Again, we are in the Hebrew Bible section. So the writings are Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, something like that, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and 1 and 2 Chronicles. Now we have the biggest section. It is the Christian canon, also called the Old Testament, I guess. Um, and this is divided into, it looks like, four sections. Now there's a space in one of them, which I don't understand why. But, uh, so four sections, uh, Roman Catholic, Protestant, oh, Roman Catholic again and Protestant, well that, oh, maybe it's a left to right chart, sorry, I'm new at this, people. So let us uh, do the first two columns together then, because it seems like uh, that's, that's how this is laid out. So in Roman Catholic, we have Genesis, and then in Protestant, we also have Genesis. So it's a sort of a compare and contrast sort of situation. Um, in fact, it looks like uh, that's why there's the space. So in the Roman Catholic, we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Those are exactly the same in the Protestant section. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of similarities with the Hebrew Bible book. So then... In the Roman Catholic side, we have Tobit and Judith. Those are not in the Protestant. So they, the Protestants said, nope, Tobit and Judith, we don't want you. Uh, get the hell out of here. Probably a bad choice of words. But we do want Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song. Oh, and so here's where it uh, different changes, differentiates. This is where it di diverts again. In Roman Catholic, they have Song of Songs, and in Protestant, they have Songs of Solomon. They changed the name. They didn't want the word song twice. They wanted Solomon in there. Um, and now we are moving on to the next part. Uh, let's see. So Roman Catholic, 
Wisdom and Sirach, S-I-R-A-C-H, those are not in the Protestant book, um, but they both have Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Lamentations. Baruch, B-A-R-U-C-H, is in Roman Catholic, but not in Protestant. And then if we look ahead, um, it looks like the most of the rest of them are in both check, checking for different spellings. All right, it looks like they're the same. Um, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, uh, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are in both. And then the last one is in Roman Catholic, but not in Protestant. It is 1 and 2 Maccabees. What's up, Protestants? You don't like the Maccabees? Fine. All right, so that was the Christian canon or the Old Testament now we have this section called Protestant Apocrypha. So this, I think, might be a subsection of the previous one because the size of that title is smaller. And um, so I guess in the Protestant book, because it looks like these are the ones that were, uh, that were not the same. For instance, Tobit and Judith, those were taken out of the Christian canon, the Old Testament, and they moved them into another thing called the Apocrypha. And maybe they added some of their own. So in this one, we have 1 and 2, Estros, Tobit, Judith, additions to Esther. Oh, Esther had more to say, I guess. Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, and then we have three under that one called Or the Wisdom, of Jesus' Son, or of Sirach. Then we have Baruch, uh, Prayer of Azariah, and the song Oh, I guess that's the whole long thing. So Ecclesiasticus, the whole title, I think, is Ecclesiasticus or the Wisdom of Jesus' Son of Sirach. Okay. Then Baruch. Then we have Prayer of Azariah and the Song of the Three Holy Children. Then we have Susanna. Oh, Susanna. Next is Bell and the Dragon. Ooh, that sounds kind of interesting. Then we have the Prayer of Manasses. And then lastly, we have 1 and 2 Maccabees, which... Uh, in the Old Testament, it was taken out of Roman Catholic and moved to the Apocrypha in the Protestant book. Make sense? Great. Uh, I am actually really curious to read the Bible. As I mentioned, that and other books, uh, I, I, I should read those. Shouldn't I? See what they have to say? Uh, see how they are similar and different? Okay. And then lastly, we have the last book of the Bible. It is the Christian canon, New Testament. And then we will just read these off. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts of the Apostles, Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colos Colossians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter, 1, 2, 3 John, John had gets more than the other people, Jude, and then Revelation or the Apocalypse. I feel like we are at the beginning of the Apocalypse. Uh, so that was the whole section, the listing of the books of the Bible. Uh, I have a lot of feelings about this. Uh, you know, people, people take the Bible literally, uh, and then, you know, I'm not going to say my judgment one way or the other on that, but I do think it's interesting that, for one, the Bible has been translated over and over again and mistranslated and also there's different versions of it there's different books there some religions are like hey we like this we don't like this so how can uh moving on bible belt that is our next word two words bees are both capitalized noun from 1925 an area chiefly in the southern u.s whose inhabitants are believed to hold uncritical allegiance to the literal accuracy of the bible broadly an area characterized by ardent religious fundamentalism. That's what the book says. I, I hope I'm not offending anybody. I'm trying to be as middle of the road as possible throughout this whole podcast. Uh, but sometimes I also have logic that I can't not think about and talk about. So sometimes things are not very logical, which I don't understand. Next, we have Bible paper. Two words. Bible is capitalized, while well, the B is the first one. Noun from 1903, and we have the number two definition for India paper. I am very curious to know what is going on there. Uh, India paper became Bible paper, or vice versa? Not sure. The last word for this episode is Bible thumper. 
two words with a hyphen. The first B in Bible is capitalized. This is a noun from circa 1923. And over an overzealous advocate of Christian fundamentalism. Bible thumping is an adjective. Um, so what, uh, well, I guess we'll just pick Bible paper as the word of the episode, because that is the only one that I, uh, am not familiar with whatsoever in this episode. I hope you're all doing well. Thank you very much for listening. Please go rate and review and share, share, share. And, uh, I, I, I appreciate you and I love you. And I hope that you are wearing your masks and wearing your gloves and doing, the right things in this weird time and staying home and washing your hands um, because that is what we all should be doing. This has been Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye.